I have found that when I took a long time on a transparent watercolor painting, it wasn't as good as the ones that I, I better turn my phone off. <laughs> But it wasn't as good as the ones where I got real direct, when I just was intuitive and used my artist brain and just, boom, put it out there. It was so much better than the one I worked and worked and worked and worked. It takes two people to paint a watercolor, one to paint it and the other one to hit you over the head and say, stop, you're ruining it. So we've all, we've all done hundreds of watercolors that we lose our way and we start to kind of lick with the brush and we don't know where we're going and in the end it's just a bunch of little marks and it doesn't really hold together. Um, let me, let me just draw you a little, a little diagram real quick. I saw this in a book and I don't know what book so if the artist is in the room then I'm in big trouble. So <laughs> I mean the author of the book. So, I, I was a graphic designer. I came, I went to Iowa State. Um, I wanted to paint, but I knew I had to get a job and it was gonna be an ad agency that I was job at. So, I came out and became a graphic designer and this was, um, I went to Iowa State in 82 to 86. So it was right before computers came out. So I'm the youngest of the old school artists because we had to render everything by hand. We had to draw our type, we had to, do all the layouts with our markers, and we, I never used a computer coming through college. And right after I got out is when the whole industry changed over. Um, so I'm a designer first, and a lot of people really don't know what that is. Um, you have to be able to arrange things in a pleasing manner, and I know that sounds really simple. Showing up or not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the first thing you have to consider are the four most important lines are the outside of your picture. Is it going to be square? Is it going to be a vertical? Is it going to be a horizontal? And so um, a lot of people, I've never been one to just say, oh, I'm painting on a, a full sheet today or a half sheet. There are a lot of people that are really true to their sizes that they're given and I always <coughs> Maybe my, my piece calls for a long horizontal or a real vertical, so I consider those four lines. Now the second step and the third step kind of are one, and I'm going to talk about, excuse me, action lines and rhythm lines. Could you write backwards, Dan? Can I write backwards? Can write backwards? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> <laughs> okay, but you, you can listen to me now and uh, you can come up and right. see it later. So action lines and rhythm lines and armature and a lot of the, now they're all going to be, you're going you're gonna to not even be able to look at this. You know, Michelangelo, they would have pyramidal stacks of people, they would consider the unseen lines and things. And I really like these rhythm lines and you'll see in this new stylized stuff, I love arcs. I love to find some exciting shapes and I like to play arcs in it and I like to find these rhythms, whether it's in water or the cracks in stone, and I like to play with those rhythm lines throughout the whole thing. Um, I'm going to be done with this in a second and it will have a point when this all comes together. Um, so the next thing is large shapes, um, linking together all of your uh, shadow shapes and making this linkage and creating this big large mass in a painting. So I'm going to just call this linkage and I'm going to talk a lot about that tonight because that's so important. This next step here is is when we get to the point where we have to name things and there's clouds and barns and horses and all these different things. So things and then, everybody's favorite, details. <laughs> right down here, all the details. And I really do come in at the top of this thing and I do a lot of little thumbnail sketches. Most people don't like to draw, whether they can draw or they don't like to. You can do a little tiny thumbnail sketch, nobody has to see it, but it just sets the tone. It could change the, the horizon line from the dead center 
it could save a piece of watercolor paper if you just kind of consider your outside lines and do a thumbnail sketch. Most people come in here, most people take a picture and they see something kind of nice, they want to paint the barn and the puffy white cloud, and they come in right here and boom, they want to jump to details as quickly as possible. And the people that come in here, their pictures fall apart. There's no structure to them, there's no design to them. And I'll show you a couple little tricks of, of trying to get some structure. You know, it's, if you come in right here, it's like coming to build a house with a truck full of boards and nails and, and plywood and just start hammering things together, you get a cobbled together look and there's no architecture, there's no plan for the whole thing. So this is an interesting little, um, just kind of different things to think about a little bit earlier on. Let's stick this back here that we can look at it a little later. I know I always talk too much and paint too little, but oh, I'll paint for you guys, I promise. Um, this is a little, a little piece that I all um, real quickly here. I'm going to try to draw two faces, and I want to just take five minutes with this, and I want to show how important it is to make make things read if you have a little bit of, of planning. So I know it's everybody's worst nightmare to try to paint. Uh, face, especially when you got the hot lights on you. It's really, really a lot of pressure. So I want to try to kind of get apples to apples here and, and get a... Okay, so I have my two faces here. So um, some of you have been in my workshops and some of you have seen me do demos before and you've probably seen this exact thing. I'm glad I don't have a mic on me because I just went to Champs and had a big giant blue cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> you would hear me kind of burping up something. That's a great. Yeah, the demo artist was really descriptive. <laughs> okay, so here I've got just just burnt sienna and uh, ultramarine blue. The colors are irrelevant. So a beginning artist says, you know, the more detail I can put into this face, the more I'm going to make it believable and my friends will think I'm a really good artist. So people have, people have eyes and we're all real excited about the eyes. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on those eyes. And they have eyelashes. And we're, I'm really getting in here. And their nose comes down. And there's that little, whatever you call it, that little snot track that comes down. <laughs> And so he has a little cleft. I used to have a little bit more of a cleft before I started eating too much, and now my head's kind of round and my cleft has kind of gone away a little bit. But anyway, there's dimples and there's eyebrows, and the hair comes down kind of like this, and the ears on the side. And my point is, is that people try to kind of create this Mr. Potato Head. They don't, they don't really consider the outside edge of the shape. They're very interested in getting in and painting every hair and every eyelash, and they think the more detail they can put in will make this face convincing. So now I'm going to come over here and paint this more like a professional. Instead of trying to call this eyes and nose and lips and do all this identification, this is a shape, and if it's lit well, it's composed of a highlight shape and a shadow shape. And in watercolor, our white generally is the white of the paper. So on the highlight side of the face, I'm going to leave the highlight shape white, and I'm going to paint the shadow side of the face. <clears throat> so um, here I do. I, I come in here, and I'm going to just say the entire eye is in shadow. And there's a shadow on this entire eye, and the side of the nose is in shadow because the light is coming from this way. And there's a shadow under the nose, the upper lip is in shadow, and that the bottom lip catches the light, so it's not in shadow. The chin has a shadow. This whole side of the face is in shadow. There's a little piece of the cheek that's open because that's catching the light. And there's just a little bit of the hair that I can see. I'm making this up. So, 
So I create this strong, and now I'm going to soften some of these edges so that, so that it's not hard, that it could be a little bit more believable. So I've created this highlight shape and this shadow shape, and if I, this is cheating a little bit because I didn't do this on the other one. If I bring a little bit of background behind it, then I'm really going to accentuate that highlight shape. So I already have, this is actually simpler than this one, but it probably reads from across the room. And how many edges do you need? Can I lose those edges? Can I lose these edges? Can you still tell it's a face? Yeah, you can. Um, beginning artists want to define every edge, and the more experienced you are, the more edges you want to lose. So, you know, there could be a little bit of a little bit of variety. There could be a little bit of darkness here and there. But, <coughs> but anyway, my point is, is this one is actually simpler, but it's more realistic. And it's, it's a highlight shape and a shadow shape. It's not eyelashes, irises, all these other little things. I know it's a funny looking little, little guy, but, but I mean, I was going to hold them up, but that doesn't work. So you can kind of get the point. From across the room, you can see how much, how much more this one reads right here. Okay, I'll stick these over here. Back when I was at the ad agencies, we did a lot of marker cops and we did a lot of tracing paper and we did a lot of down and dirty, quick drawing with markers. And this, this little center scene right here, I'm kind of looking at it like that. I put a piece of tracing paper over this and what the tracing paper does is it's like Claude Monet looking at the world through squinted eyes. You can't see the details and it drives your analytical brain crazy. And I took a black marker and everything that was medium gray to dark gray I made black. Um, so, so when you go out on a location, a lot of people paint in the studio, but when you go out on a location, the first thing I try to do is I try to find a big linked together, exciting silhouette shape. And a lot of times, size of our picture. And it wasn't until I got frustrated by painting all these wonderful little thumbnails and then turning them up into big dogs. I mean, they just looked like dogs breakfasts. I kept adding detail as the picture got bigger. So this morning I just traced this and I went down to Kinko's Copies and I blew this up how big and how simple and how descriptive the shape is. So I'm, I'm really trying to just capture this beautiful shape. If any of you have seen Andy Evenson's work, and it's just, it is just wonderful, pure, traditional British watercolor. He's just a master of simplifying and distilling just some big shapes. And it's almost, it's almost like you're looking into a, a set of a play and you've got your background shape on the back wall and you've got your mid sets um, props in the middle and then you've kind of got your proscenium and it's just boom, boom, boom. And it sounds kind of confusing, but, but when I enter a painting, I, I try to decide if I'm gonna make deep space or flat space. And oftentimes, the more I paint it, the more I wanna have flat shapes. And when I stylize some of these acrylics, they re become real decorative. They almost look like stained glass windows. So they are very decorative and flat. When I paint my watercolor, I'm thinking things of flat silhouettes, and I use color and value to make them come forward or go back. So um, the shapes that are farther back are cooler, and they don't have as much contrast. The shapes that are forward, they have more contrast, and they're warmer. Just by using color and value, you can make these flat shapes come back and go forth. So, um, here we go. I've got this thing here, and when I paint landscapes, I usually paint from the top down. And, I'm going to show you one more thing. Oh, we're doing perfect with three. Okay. A lot of times, landscapes, if you're out painting a plein air landscape, you read the landscape like a book. There are action lines. There are actually ways your eye moves throughout a picture. So when I see this picture right here, 
this line coming across here has got to be exciting. It can't be repetitious. Maybe there's four palm trees that are right in a row and they're all the same height. Change them. So I'm going to move it. I'm going to change them. I like to think of a heartbeat. And I like to think of some, some action. Here's another action line. Um, I'm going to try to tie these little shadow shapes to the bottom of the boats. So I'm going to try to make this mass of white boats and these mass of white, um, white houses here kind of connect. So this line coming across here is an exciting line. There's going to be a post right here and this. So I have three action lines. And I always want to do this, but that doesn't do any good. Okay. So. That's where my painting happens, it's right there on the edge. And there is a, a dear, 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 dear friend of mine, Karen Knudsen, in her workshops. She always talks about having these little rivers of light and rivers of dark and getting the viewer, whether you're working realistically or whether you're working abstractly, you want to lead the viewer through your picture. And I liked it. I'm going to have a little white boat connected to this white boat, connected to these houses, connected. There's going to be some interesting little linkage in the lights as well as the darks, hopefully. Um, okay, so all I have to do is paint this one shape. And, and I have a hard time thinking and painting and talking at the same time. Um, a, a kind of a traditional. A, a British traditional, Trevor Chamberlain is a, is a wonderful contemporary British artist. He paints very small, he paints very traditionally. He only uses about five or six colors in his palette. Mm -hmm. And he loves to, to just lay down raw sienna first. It's, it's like almost painting on tinted paper. Um, so he calls it liquid light. And First, my disclaimer is, is everybody who teaches you something is going to say something different. And everybody thinks they're right because that's the way they paint. <laughs> so this is the way I, I like to do it. Um, so I'm going to just warm this scene up a little bit. I'm not going to get the whole paper wet. I'm going to try to just paint it a little at a time. The way I'm going to harmonize this and not make it look too disjointed is I'm going to use the same colors when I go from piece to piece. So. There's a little warmth, a little warmth with my thing. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go too crazy with the blue sky. There's a lot of skies that were kind of rose almost. Maybe that was my, after about four margaritas, they were all kind of rose. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to evenly kind of cover this, this raw sienna. And, Watercolors are easier to paint in the summertime when there's moisture in the air. They're harder to paint in the wintertime when the air's dry. You don't have as much open time. So watercolors, hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. You've got to know exactly how much water's on your brush. You've got to know exactly how much water's on your paper. And the trick is, is you want to have more paint on your brush than is on the paper. Um, and you also want to have, sometimes you want to mix up paint that's a little thicker, like cream you got to get some different